Hello and welcome to another episode of the Breachside Broadcast, home of the finest voxcasting either side of the breach. And welcome to a new chapter in our ongoing saga. A stone has been cast into the waters of fate, and its ripples will be felt on both sides of the breach. In Malifaux, the powers that be rule by force. Some use brute strength, others rely on devious weaponry or arcane magic. But as today's story will demonstrate, sometimes the pen is the mightiest weapon of all. I hope you enjoy Extra Extra, right after this word from our sponsor. This episode of the Breachside Broadcast is brought to you by the Ridley Regulator, the only Daily Gazette worth reading in Ridley. The current issue features another damning expose on the Union's devious plots to extort the Guild and exploit workers. Ace reporter Nellie Cochran stops at nothing to bring you the truth. Pick up a copy at any newsstand and read all about it. Extra Extra by Matthew Ritter Extra Extra, or The Woman Who Could Not Be Kept From Work, or Being Memories of the Adventures and Times of Fiona Gage and Her Struggles Against Brooding Oppression in Malifaux, therein who goes upon a tantalizing quest, first involving a horrendous accident that would have killed a lesser robust personage, being ramshackled and bamboozled by the United Powers in a lofty and foolish attempt to keep her from work, she capables beyond a doubt. Finally, in climax, a pitch tussle that proves the little worker man, or female persuasion, can using her superior talents to victory upon the day. Written by herself, and now set forth by Nellie Cochran. Rams hack lead. A slow, deep voice sounded out the word. It had one of those warbles that made it clear the owner of the voice was frowning. What's that even supposed to mean? The voice seemed more intent on getting words out than pronouncing them correctly. It often took a few moments to reconfigure the vowel soup into proper sentences in the listener's head. It means... It's meant to give the implication of the power of a ram with the confining sensation of being shackled. Also, with the touch of shack in there, to have a very precarious, even perilous vibe to the overall production. The second voice was much different. It was much faster, and filled with the import of its own diction, a voice that never missed letters like T or D. Precarious was always pronounced with a solid P at the start, and a hard S at the end. You made it up. Fiona Gage was a strapping lass, the kind that came from farms and worked her whole life because there hadn't been enough boys in the family, or maybe just because another pair of hands was just another pair of hands. Not strapping for a woman, just strapping, full stop. The pickaxe on her belt gave her away as a miner. The chipped head and worn handle made it clear it wasn't for show. Only her hat seemed out of place. It was tilted to one side as if to cover a bad haircut, though nothing about her made her seem like someone who cared much what people thought of her hair. Nellie, on the other hand, was small, compact, slight, narrow, and cute. The cap she wore pulled down low on her head and the dirt on her face seemed a solid attempt to pass for a boy though it failed. There was something far too feminine in the shape of her lips and cheeks, or maybe in the way she scoffed at Fiona's statement. 
confaggled the word up? Hardly. These are all roots and words that exist in the ether all around us already. A bit here, a bit there. Creating something new that feels like treasure from the old texts. Nellie stood up in her chair. Maybe it was to give her some height over the other woman, who was still almost taller than Nellie, even with the chair's help. Or maybe it was just to grandstand. If it was the latter, it must have been from muscle memory, because it was just the two of them in the printing office after hours. Empty desks stretched out like a ghost town around them. Words, Nellie continued in her grandiose way, one hand reaching up as if to pluck the very truth of words out of the air are not like boxes or chairs or doors. They are not simply one thing. They are magical, Fiona. Magic more pure than anything you'll get from a soul stone. They touch emotions, the raw core of who we are. Love, lust, power, fear. These are ideals more than words. Words like troglodyte or bamboozled have colour. Words like crush or shove have real impact. Words can change people, and the world is people, so words have the power to change this very world. Fiona didn't look up from the paper she was still puzzling through. So you made it up. She straightened the paper as best she could. Probably made up confaggled and percurious as well. Noticing the ink stains on her fingers, the lass wiped her hand on her overalls over and over with an annoyed grunt. The paper's messy. I don't like the feel of it. Books at least feel solid. This paper feels oily, snaky-like. Nellie tipped her chair over and landed with her hands up like she was on the dismount. Don't despair. Your story will help spread the word of the travesty that is the Union and its attempts to ramshackle the common man. Fiona, you can be their light. The Guild could use you as the rallying point they've been needing. Nellie took a moment, kneading, kneading, to crush the union and free the minds of their noxious touch. She let her hand fall on Fiona's shoulder for emphasis. The temperature of the room dropped. Get your hand off me. Fiona's voice changed. Something about her tone turned Nellie's blood to ice water, and her hand skittered off Fiona's shoulders as fast as it was able disappearing behind Nellie's back. Sorry, I didn't mean to. I don't like it. Fiona glared with her one good eye. The other glowed a deep crimson. Half of Fiona's face was metal. She'd lost a lot of her skull in the accident. The explosion should have killed her, but she'd been lucky. The right tech, the right magic, at the right time. Being touched? Really, I won't trespass again. Nellie stepped back as the other woman stood. Fiona was tall, but right now she felt gigantic, towering over the smaller woman. I don't like it. Her voice kept that steely, oiled quality, like midnight spilling out of her, and the red orb in the broken half of her face became a beacon that signalled nothing but rage. Any eye it. Her words slurred together. A pillar of rock burst out of the ground next to the two of them sending desks and wood flying. Nellie was smart enough to know to run. The printing press was, too. Half the desks were smashed. The other half were cracked. The printing press itself had managed to stay in one piece, its long spider legs keeping it one step ahead of the rampaging woman. It moved tentatively now that danger was over. Even though it had no eyes, it seemed to peek around things, as if expecting another outburst. Nellie did the same. Her hand was all that could be seen around the corner. You okay in there? Her mouse-like voice just barely tested the waters, a verbal toe into the ripples. There was a sob. It wasn't a pretend sob for attention or anything like that. It was wet and full, the kind that came with running noses and dripping eyes. Nellie peeked around the corner just a bit more. Fiona's back rested against the pillar of stone that had come up through the floor. Nellie let her eyes slide back over to the sobbing woman. Fiona's arms were around her knees, the image of a schoolgirl no one wanted to have lunch with. Most of the lamps had been smashed, 
but there was enough light left to see the glistening tracks of tears from her still human eye. Nellie inched out a bit further. She didn't mention how expensive all the stuff Fiona had broken had been, which was really very nice of her if she didn't think so herself. Really walloped the place, huh? Showed us a good what for. My head hurts. Fiona gave a snort. Her hand was pressed against the metal plate that made up much of her face. It hurts so much. Don't look at me. I know it hurts, and, um... Nellie turned around so her back was to the other woman. How's this? Not a vision gazes upon your visage. Not a one. Her arms spread wide. Fiona sniffled in reply. That stone trick is really something, huh? Get mad and you can shape and pull stone to your will. Symbolically pure. I wish I had the ability to just twist rock to my liking. I'd trade magic powers for a few headaches any day. Soul stones in the noggin makes you special, Nellie said with her back still turned. Still just the wet sounds of sadness. Nellie took a deep breath. It's the bits about that, isn't it? Where I talk about your headaches and the rages. The magical side effects of the experimental procedure. It's the idea of other people reading about that. Well, I can see why you might not be so full of vim and vinegar over it. Downright perturbed, even. Don't worry, I can leave that little nugget out. See, my thought was it gave you a humanization quality. Something people could relate to. But really, you're right. You should be portrayed as an idealized Adonis. Better than real. Half metal, half... Another sob from Fiona cut nearly off mid-bluster. I can leave those bits out, is all I'm saying. Fiona wipes her nose with her sleeve. I never hurt anyone. Not like that. Not before that day. Now it's like that's all I think about. Anytime anyone does anything I don't like, I can't... The story's just about fine, I guess. I don't get it. All of it, at least. But it seems good, maybe. It wasn't the story. She hugged her knees harder. Nellie turned around. What was it, then? The ink wouldn't come off of my fingers. She held her hands up. They were still a bit smudged. No matter how much I wiped them, they just wouldn't come clean. Oh, was that all? Nellie chuckled, almost a chortle. Don't make fun of me. The bark was fast and hard, and that red glare surged. No, 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 no. I can get it off easy. Here, yeah, come on. I'll show you. Nellie's small hand touched the other woman's. Nellie smiled, tugging softly on the hand not holding the pickaxe. Probably because it was so surprising, Fiona let the pickaxe drop. A look of confusion on her face as she climbed to her feet and into another room. There was a small wash basin, a tiny mirror, and a strange-looking bar of soap in the washroom. The ink gets all over everything. It's a damn nuisance if you don't mind my language, but it is. We keep this special pumice soap around, made from volcano rocks, can you believe it? The things people come up with in this day and age. Nellie watched as Fiona dipped her hand in the water and started scrubbing her fingers with the rough soapstone. Now if that doesn't do the trick, some rubbing alcohol generally works, though I think... The water was grimier than when they started, but Fiona's fingers were fresh, clean and pink, maybe the cleanest they'd ever been. Fiona worked without a word, as if transfixed by what was going on with her hand. She stared at the clean fingers like they were new. I know it must be hard. The accident. It only happened because of the miners' union, you know. Those money-grubbing devils don't have a fair thought amongst them, what with forcing the guild to pay double what they need to, and they still don't treat the workers with the proper safety and respect. Sure, they paid for you to get fixed up as best they could, but they still botched it. Bad doctors. That's why you get the rages. Then they tell you that you can't work anymore. You're supposed to just go home and... I know what happened, Fiona said quietly. Let me finish. I'm pontificating here. And you refuse. You swing that axe of yours not just for yourself, 
but for everyone that's ever been pushed around by those unionized jackalopes. They send a dozen toughs and you send them all packing. They send three dozen toughs and the other workers join with you and they relent and let you work. You showed those corrupt moneybaggers what for. You really did, Fiona. Nellie watched as Fiona held up her now clean hands. Let me tell the world about it. Let me make you into the symbol you already are, but no one knows about yet. A pickaxe to guide the way. Fiona's face was soft, lost. Um... Her words drifted as she wiped her nose yet again. Um... Nellie let go. Pickaxe. Pickaxe, she snapped her fingers. Crickets, that's perfect. The pickaxe will be your symbol. She painted a pickaxe in the air with her fingers as if sculpting it. I'll have to restructure the piece. The axe you once wielded for your oppressors now strikes back against them. Ha! Fiona's face lost its softness. I don't know. I'll think about it. Nellie halted mid-gesticulation. It was a bit like watching a marionette freeze. Right, okay, think about it. After all the damage and... Nellie looked back into the smashed up room. Not that it matters. No worry, no worry, it, it's fine. The paper's doing great. A few smashed chairs and desks is nothing. Nellie pulled her cap off and ran her fingers through her hair for a moment before putting it back on. At least let me walk you home. A proper lady should never travel these roads by gloaming. Ah. Uh, Fiona's fingers rubbed against one another. Nellie self-corrected quickly. At night. You shouldn't travel around at night. Alone. All right. Let me grab my things. Fiona didn't have much. Just a small bag and her pickaxe. She spent a long time collecting them regardless. And I'm sorry about this. And about not being sure about the story. Tut, tut. Nellie raised a hand and waved away Fiona's comments easily. Tut, tut. She glanced down at one of the smashed desks. Hers, as it happened. She was a bit disappointed. If she'd been writing this scene, the ledger on her desk would have been open, and she would have been able to glance down and see in an instant just how deep in the red the paper was. But no, it was closed. No obvious symbolism for her today. It was just one of the little ways real life always disappointed her. Nary a worry or care from you. The damages will be fine and the story, as it's a story about you, you of course have full proprietary control. Rights, perpetuities, amenities. I would never have it any other way. Nelly moved over and held her arm up, elbow out. Fiona pursed her lips. I'm not going to walk around town holding you. The elbow dropped. Suit yourself. You know you're a lady too, right? Said Fiona. Ah, indubitably. There is nary a day that I am not reminded time and time again. Shall we? Nellie motioned to the door. Her hat came off in her hand as she tipped her head towards it. It was jaunty, like most things she did. Nell, you are so strange. Fiona shook her head as she walked out. Nellie took one last look around the destroyed room. She patted the top of the printing press as it nudged up against her. And you may be more trouble than you're worth, Fiona Gage, but that is yet to be seen. Ridley at night was much like any other city. Streets, lamps, young men working as torch holders, helping people get from place to place for a few coins, and offering advice on where to avoid so as not to get stabbed by muggers. On this side of the breach, though, things are always different, no matter how much the cities may look like those Earthside. Fiona Gage, you are one of the most impressive personages I have had the jubilation to meet. I want you to know that. The slick attempts to coat Fiona in verbal butter had been continuing for quite a few blocks. Nellie's high, excited voice seemed to always find a way to echo whenever possible. Sometimes it sounded like a small crowd of her was prodding Fiona to give in and accept the story. Fiona had been quiet since they'd left the office. Monosyllabic. Yeah. Nah. Uh. 
She kept her head down and her hands in her overalls. Now she spoke a full sentence. I only get about half of what you say most of the time. Her voice was a frustrated mumble. Nellie gave a slow spin. Ah, well, I do tend to have a varied and visceral verbiage. I won't argue with you on that point. Fiona was quiet for a few more steps. Nellie, for the first time, let the silence be silent. The larger lass looked up. Nellie watched her, straining desperately to not ask what was on her mind. Fiona's face almost twitched, her eyes widening as the moment stretched out. No. For a moment, Nellie thought her patience had paid off. But then Fiona continued with, Nah, never mind. Fiona kept walking. Nellie hissed quietly and bit her lower lip. She'd been just on the cusp of something. A real connection, she could feel it. That's all she needed and she'd... Nell. Nellie let out the most simple and barely audible hmm she could muster. Do you talk like that, the way you do, to make sure everyone knows how smart you are? It was Nellie's turn to stare silently, and not for effect. You see a lot more of the world around you than some would assume she murmured. Before Nellie could continue their journey, an arm like steel shot out in front of her. Huh? Uh, Fiona, I meant that as a compliment. I should hope you know I only meant... Stop flapping your gums for once. Fiona calmly removed the pickaxe from her belt and swung it onto her broad shoulders. Whoever's there, come out. The creatures that came out of the dark weren't twisted or gnarled. Most of the worst monsters in Malifaux didn't have sharpened teeth or tree-like limbs. Some wore top hats and had chains wrapped around their wrists, or axe handles in their grip, like the thirteen men that appeared in front of them. They had just enough class in their attire to show how low rent they truly were. Thought you'd be around here about now, didn't I? The lead man's voice and diction put Fiona's to shame. It was a beautiful mix of a few missing teeth and just not caring. Seems to me it must be the famous Miss Gage. That'd be ya. He gave a bow. A slightly smushed top hat twirled in his fingers, rolled up his arms over his shoulders, and rolled back down to the other hand. Pleased to meet ya. Fiona stood like a brick wall unto herself. There was no wind. Nellie wished there was wind, because the way Fiona stood, her hair should have been blowing very dramatically. Her eye glowed in the dark with soulstone light. The magic that kept her together always seemed brightest right before the rage took her. Nellie peeked around Fiona's at the thugs. She wanted to say something dramatic with a lot of wit and whimsy to it. Something that would make them really realise just whom they were dealing with. Some kind of pun about their lapels, maybe, or a... Uh... Yeah, Fiona said. One word. Nellie cocked her head. It wasn't bad but it really seemed to be missing the necessary oomph to really sell the moment. Well then, we got the message from the Union. Get her, boys. That top hat flew at Fiona's face, and he charged after it. It was a good trick, classic. Fiona didn't twitch as the hat bounced off her metal plate. The pickaxe swung, and there was a wet cracking slop. Bone, blood, organs. Everything inside of him just gave way. He came up off his feet. He sailed and hit the dingy wall of the alley a good fifteen feet away, and he hit it hard. A few of the less well-placed bricks cracked and fell. His crumpled body fell to the ground, and Nellie suspected he would not be getting back up in this lifetime. The rest of the men had pulled and readied weapons. Knives, pistols, chains, things of that nature. They all paused mid-attack. That was definitely the oomph Nellie had been hoping for. You should all know this is on the record. I, as a representative of the Ridley Regulator, Ridley's most prestigious daily gazette, will write up every last bit of this encounter. I will make sure each of you are known by face and likeness. My memory is eidetic. Every hair or lack thereof on each of your heads is committed to it. I shall give the authorities a full report if you do not cease this very moment. The last of the ruffian's footfalls could be heard rounding the corner away from them as Nellie finished. Ha! Ah, good. I scared them off. Fiona heaved. Her body seemed to expand and shrink with her breathing. Her eye gleamed bright. 
Nellie took a step back when it turned to gaze at her. You? Fiona asked. You did that? The glow faded. Not sure what I would have done if I was alone. A smile flitted across Fiona's lips. It was just the connection Nellie had been hoping for. You'd have been quite adrift, floating like a ship with no harbour or navigator. Fiona looked at the man that lay cracked like an egg against the ground. Should we... I don't know. Help him? I didn't mean to... He would have done worse to us, I'm sure. Probably has many a time. Feel not a speck of guilt. Still, we'll see who we can muster up for help. I'm sure a constable or two must be working at this time of night. Nelly let out an odd little yip. And what a rush! It's a good thing they were cowards. When I saw the pistol, I thought things were grim, but they showed their true souls. They were painted and lacquered with failure through and through. Fiona got down on one knee next to the downed man. The Union. He said they were from the Miners' Union. They were here to stop the story. Nellie could not stop herself from grinning. That they were. Well, I think you should publish that story now. I don't like being pushed around. It lacked the dramatic punch Nellie would have liked. She'd been hoping for... They failed, or something along those lines. Oh well. She could write it that way easily enough. Don't you worry, Fiona. I'll put every last bit of this down in type. They'll regret the attempt. By noon tomorrow, Fiona Gage's pickaxe will be a symbol against oppression everywhere. Nellie held her hand high, like she was holding a pickaxe herself. Fiona stood. Her large shape was silhouetted in the dark night, and she hefted her very real pickaxe above her. In the shadows, only her gleaming red eye could be seen. Now that was drama. That's it for another episode of the Breachside Broadcast. Join us next time for the conclusion of Extra Extra. Extra.